This is part four of the holiness of God. I've, someone asked me today, how am I doing? I said, this was supposed to be a 45-minute lecture on the holiness of God. The pastor laughed me when I said I was going to do it in one. But this is part four, and I'm praying that I'll be done. That's the goal, is to be done so we could do something different uh, the next time that we have doctrine for dummies. Or the pastor might even put his spiritual gift thing, I mean, his Holy Spirit part, into doctrine for dummies, if you'd like. So just we can keep it going. But So we're on the holiness of God. So here's a question I'd like to start with. How does God, the Holy One of Israel, the one we're talking about, now you have to, when I'm talking, you have to think about these last three weeks, what I've been talking about, about the holiness of God, what we've been trying to learn. How does he deal with those who claim him as as his God, as their God? But their lifestyle does not reveal that what they say is true. This is not rhetorical. This is your part now. What do you think? There there are some who are not saved that he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you, which is an amazing statement. It's not like he didn't know who they were. It's that they had never had an intimate relationship with him. That's the kind of no. There are like that. Right? <coughs> Somebody else. That's a good answer. That's not the only answer, by the way, but that's that's part of it. How about the ones that are saved? Are you afraid to answer because you're in that group or what? (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's just, I would think that would be one of his questions. Like, like exactly what are you doing? You know, why are you living like you're living? You know, it's sort of like if you're married, why would you live like you're single? We allowed him to go into captivity. He, he yes. If we're talking about this book, right. I'm pointing at my Bible for those of you that can't see. He had, he was very harsh and judgmental on people. I understand that he's a loving God, but you understand he's also holy. That's right. And his holy holiness will not permit him to even look upon sin. That's why he ter- that's why Jesus was saying, God, why did you turn your back? Well, because the sins of the world are on Jesus Christ, and he is so holy, he doesn't do that. Uh, uh, God's not going to change. Do you understand that? Mm-hmm. I, God can't change. Do you understand? I, I don't know if I said this to this group or some other group, but to change, you have to go to either change to the better or change to the worse. You can't change to the same and say you change. And God can't get any better, and he's not going to get any worse. So how in the world could he change? What would he change to? He has no need to change. There's nothing wrong with him. And so if he is holy then, he is holy now. He is mercies are new every morning, but he is the same every day. We have the ever-changing, never-changing God. His mercies are new. Praise the Lord. But he is still holy. And we, if he demanded to be treated holy by the people he said are my people, because I don't believe that the church in Israel are the same. I think they're so different. It's amazing. But... At the same time, if we are his church, the bride of his son, he also expects us to be, I think the word is pure and unspotted. And you can't live a life to a holy God that doesn't demonstrate that you're a holy God and believe you're doing the right thing. You would be what the Bible would call deceived. In Isaiah, you see, God is finally to the place. This is in the 700 B.C.s. These people are listening to this, are living in the the B.C. 700s. This is not at the beginning of Israel. It's not right after the Exodus. This is a long time later. They're toward the end. This is when Israel will go into captivity and Judah is on its way on a fast track. And so... Isaiah is a prophet to Judah. God, through Isaiah, is going to present a legal case to his people and take them to his holy court, not the world's court. Because the world court would excuse them. But he's taking to his court. He is the judge. So the first thing we're going to study about today is Isaiah and the holiness of God. And that's found in chapter 6. 
Now, in the beginning of chapter 6, I'll just read the first two verses. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And it stood above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, which he, two which we covered his face, two he covered his feet, and two with he flew. And verse 3 said, they cried to one another, holy, holy, holy. Let's not get past the first part. Note where the seraphim were. I think this was interesting as I studied and, and, and uh, I thought I'd just throw it in. They were above the throne. Above the throne. This is one of your fill outs, by the way, for the newer people. Now, originally, according to Ezekiel 28, there was a different covering for the throne above God. His name was in a, he was an anointed cherub. And most people believe that was Lucifer. And he was placed there by God. That was one of the things that God did. But Lucifer, from within, not from, from without, not God caused, but self-generated, said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the Most High. In other words, I, I think I'll make myself God. I'll be just like him. That's Isaiah 14. Uh, you don't have the verses there, but you have the, the references. God had a response for that. He stated, you were, past tense, blameless. There was no sin in Lucifer that was just amplified by his thoughts. It's the age-old question, where did the thought come from? And the only answer I could tell you is within. Where did the genesis for the thought come from? Within the within. He sought and decided he could be like God. And before you get too hard on him, we do that every day. When we purposely choose against what God has told us to do in our lives, we become like God. But God said, I will cast you to the ground. I will throw you out of heaven. If that's a better word for you to understand it. That's in Ezekiel. And in Isaiah, we hear, Oh, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, the star of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. Do you understand? This is happening before the nations even exist. But God sees that there's, this is going to be the result. Nowadays, he's not there, so the seraphim take his place. The word is seraph. The I am on the end makes it plural. Anytime you read a Bible verse that has I am on the end and a name or a person or a pronoun, it just takes the same word and makes it plural. The word seraph actually means the fiery ones. Do you remember the, the serpent that was held up in numbers that everybody was supposed to look at? So that if they looked at that, that, is, that has the same name on it, seraph. People actually learned to worship that. It was a fiery creature. Incidentally, the, um, one of the cult nations, the Assyrians, had seraphs in their throne room, statues of seraphs in their throne room. A little different. They had different kind of tails, and they looked a little different, but they had six wings on them. It's kind of interesting. So instead of the anointed one, the one that God originally wanted there, being there, now the seraphim are there. Every time you see a seraphim in the Bible, you will see them separating God from people. That's one of the things they do. So, now we come to where we are in history. Uzziah was a good king. He seems to spell, it seems like God takes this time in history, like in the same way that at the proper time Jesus came to, on the earth, and in my humble but accurate opinion, the right time was when the language, the lingua franca, that's the way you'd say it, the language of the people was Greek. It was spoken throughout by, because of Alexander and more likely his mother who wanted to spread Greek thought and Greek philosophy across the entire kingdom and his kingdom reached across the world. The Romans came in with a highway system and 
places of guard shacks all over the place, little place of soldier. It was safe to travel. Before that, every time you travel, you're going to get waylaid by somebody. The language was right, that was right, and the uh, time of the world, Romans were very, very rich, and they shared what they did with the people. They built a lot of things in the towns they were, so they were financially able even to travel and have places to rest. It was the perfect time to come to the earth. There was never a time like that up until that point where all that could happen. But this seems to be, in antiquity, a time when Isaiah, what's happening during Isaiah is going to be a picture of what's going to happen to Judah. It's already happened to Israel. 732, they go into Syria. So Uzziah's death actually encapsulates and reflects the nation's decline. He was the last of the really good kings. Now, technically, that's not true because his son was counted a good king as well, but his son didn't actually last that long. And the one after his son was one of the most evil kings that has ever been in Israel. I mean, in Judah. So Judah is weak and impotent as a country. They are, they fought with Israel. They fought with the people around them. They're making alliances. What, read in the Bible. This all happens in 2 Chronicles 26, Uzziah. 25, the kings before him. 27, his son. 28, the next king, Ahaz. So when you start to look through it, if you want to read the history, that's where you go, 2 Chronicles from 23 on in that area, and, and you'll get an idea of what's happening in the world. And one of the reasons that Israel, I mean, that Judah is impotent without power, that is, is because they're becoming more and more like the world around them. Well, excuse me for interjecting, but a sermon goes there about our world today. Listen, the only thing different about our country is that we are different. The minute we lose our differentness, we stand for the wrong thing. And to stand for nothing is to stand for lots of wrong things. And the church needs to be salt and light in the world. So what good is salt if it's not salty? And what good is light if it's hidden under a basket? Or a bucket? Or a building? What good are we if we do what we do, we do here and we're not reaching out to not just Clovis, that's our Jerusalem. But how about to our Judea? Our state country system. How about to the uttermost parts of the world, past Samaria? To these people, when Jesus said that, they're going, what? When the Holy Spirit said that in Acts, you'll be empowered to do that? These people, some of these people have never traveled more than 150 miles in their whole life. Jesus never went more than 150 miles in his whole life. And now we're supposed to carry it to the whole world. And you say, well, how could that be done? And here's the answer. You get a big God. Listen to this sentence. I like it because I read it. <laughs> I'd rather have a little faith in a big God than big faith in a little God. Because I can always get more faith. I can develop my faith. And the minute our church takes their eyes off of the world and starts putting them on ourselves is the day our church will die. So, end of that sermon. Got that one in pretty good. So Isaiah's ministry is during the time. It actually starts about the time that Uzziah dies. This chapter 6, people say, is the beginning. There's, there's an argument. Is this... Is six out of place, or is it is? Did he start in first about one through five chapters, and then six, one through six chapters, and then chapter six is where it, his ministry starts, and so they don't know where to start his ministry. But it's the year that Uzziah dies, which would have been five, uh, seven thirty nine or so. So, he's king during, he's a he's a prophet during four kings, Uzziah. His son, Jotham. Uzziah was 16 when he became a king. His son becomes king when he's 25. Uzziah dies when he's about 68 or so. Some of you are older than Uzziah. And then Ahaz, the evil one. And then Hezekiah. 
that's all the kings that he was over. In the same way that Billy Graham is, was supposedly America's preacher for several presidents in a row. So he was very successful. I mean, he was really successful. The Bible says a lot of good about him for the first section of Second, Second Chronicles 26. And then all of a sudden, he's getting richer. The country's getting bigger. He's getting more notoriety. And then all of a sudden, in Chronicles, in verse 16, yes, all of a sudden, he becomes arrogant. I am the king. I can do what I want. So he goes into the holy place. Now, you remember that the, the temple is built with a holy place and then a holy of holies, two separate rooms in the temple. In the tabernacle, is one big tent with, the, with a curtain between, but in the temple, there are two separate rooms. And he, did go, he doesn't go into the holy of holies like Pompey did when he defeated Jerusalem, but he goes in to light incense to pray to God. The problem is only priests are allowed in the holy place. And the priests confront him. And there's little interaction. And as they're confronting him about what are you doing in the holy place, he breaks out with leprosy. Now, if anybody, anything will keep you out of the temple, it is leprosy. You are unclean. From that point on, he lives, his, he lives in a house that's isolated from everyone else. He was so arrogant, he lifted himself until he was no one. <laughs> and then his son is a co-regent with him. So if you're going to draw their, their lines, you would put, they would overlap like this. So he actually dies after his son is co-regent, and then his son goes on for a little bit more until he's replaced. So his son jo jo Jotham comes into place, and the Bible says about him, he was a good king. Let me quickly say this. In the Bible, a good king and a bad king has nothing to do with their governing decisions. It has everything to do with did they follow the tenets of their predecessors. In, in Judah, it would be Rehoboam. In Israel, it would be Jeroboam. And it'll say he did the same thing that his father did. He was ungodly. They worshipped idols. He was a good king. He did not, the Bible says, and he didn't go into the holy place. And then there's a strange comment in there that I just, I can't get past. But the people still acted corruptly. So it wasn't their leader. You understand? It's the people's choice on how they're going to worship God. Their concept of God is going down and down and down. He's less and less and less holy. He's more and more and more one of the boys or even worse, one of the pantheon of gods that are in the world at that time. He's just another God, and that's what the world is trying to do to God today. See, the world doesn't care if you're spiritual. The world cares if you're a Christian. <coughs> you can be spiritual all you want. You can hang a crystal from your rearview mirror and pray to it all day long, and nobody will say anything to you. You can put a crystal on your desk at work, and nobody will say anything to you. You bring a Bible to work, see what happens. See, Isaiah's ministry was not going to be regarded. Why? Because he had a message of doom. The first five chapters of the book of Isaiah is all about you all are doing it wrong. You made this mistake. 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 But he's God's spokesman and God wants to do it. You see, the, the, the whole message, the whole vision that Isaiah had forms a bridge between the inevitability of God's judgment and the coming Messiah. That's what I say Isaiah does. That's where we get a, a virgin is going to give birth to a child and he's going to be the king of kings. That's where he's going to be the wonderful counselor and all of those things we've learned about Jesus. This is the bridge. He gives all the judgments and then God shows him his holiness and then he's, but he's really pointing towards the Messiah. And the need for the Messiah. You think if you preach that every day, you'd have a great crowd in church? I'm thinking not. So how, how, what did Isaiah need in order to preach this message of judgment? That's the question. And the answer is he needs to see the holiness of God. Because 
even Isaiah doesn't seem like he really does understand just how holy God is. A man like Isaiah, with the commitment that he has, and the calling that he has, and the knowledge, the understanding, the, I understand what my job is, I'm going to do it. He still doesn't get exactly how holy it is, so God's going to give him a vision to show him just how holy he is. He sees God in the temple. He sees him on the throne. I am convinced that he didn't see God. He got a spirit. You don't see spirit. But he saw parts of the essence of God. And then, you remember the word anthropomorphism? He, he uses earthly language in the Bible to try to show us what the concept was when he's looking at God. Where is God? He is on the throne. The throne doesn't shake. He doesn't have people coming around saying, here's how to do it. There are no advisors next to God's throne. There's only his son. And he saw him sitting enthroned, high and exalted. Every, even the temple shook. The whole earth shook where he was. That's how big it was. It was as dramatic a vision of God as you could understand. You, you just couldn't understand it. So what's his response? And the answer is this. Well, I could tell you what it wasn't. Every once in a while I watch Christian television and then I turn it off because I don't want to break my television. So I was watching a guy the other day who said, I saw G Jesus came and stood in my bedroom and talked to me. He was 25 feet tall. I'm thinking, how big is his room? <laughs> or did he just see him like from the navel down? I, I, I don't know. It just kills me. But he was proud of it. And he said it prospered him. Listen to what Isaiah said. He, he wasn't impressed with his own significance. I saw God. He didn't go out and buy a t-shirt. I saw God. Deal with it. He didn't start his own church. I saw God church. The follow me. Materials, Bible studies, TV shows. In fact, his self-esteem was not enhanced. I hear that all the time. You, you need more self-esteem. Listen, what you really need is a holy God that you will follow. Let him do the steaming. His vision caused him to lament over who he was. He saw God Humbly. I think I shared with you last week. If not, I, I want to do it. One of the men I mentor, about two weeks ago, I said to him, tell me where you're going. Where's all this leading you? How's it helping you? And, and he looked at me, he smiled. He said, he did like this. Well, you know, the more I learn about God, the humbler I get. I'm thinking, yes. <laughs> He's got it. See, because Isaiah saw that God was holy, and he wasn't. He saw that God wasn't sinful, and he was. And it destroyed him. He said, if you really want to hear the translation of the word, I came from together. I, I just fell apart. My parts fell. I am undone. It's like if you took the seams out of clothing, it would be undone. I am undone. It's a perfect picture of what God is trying to show Israel. Your sin has excluded me from your presence, but you are able to be cleaned and come back into my presence. Watch what happens to Isaiah. His sin excluded him from the fellowship that he wanted to have with God. Even though he was one of the major players, God still wanted to have a closer relationship with him. And by the way, he wants to have a closer relationship with me, and he wants to have a closer relationship with you. And we're the ones that are limiting the re relationship by the amount of sin that we live in our lives. By the way, we don't honor him. I, 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 you've heard me say this before. The biggest problem in my life is that the majority of my sins are socially acceptable. Nobody gets on me about it, but I know they're wrong. And somehow 
I do them because I didn't, I'm not doing what I used to do, and evidently God ought to give me some award for that, and there isn't any. And so, you see, because of that, the most significant thing for me about this whole passage of Scripture is that Isaiah sees his sinfulness and his people. And it's, <laughs> it's amazing to me to notice that the car curse that Isaiah senses is recognized to his lips, but the cure from it was went to the exact same place. God did not put coals to Isaiah's feet because he ran to sin. He didn't put coals on Isaiah's hands because he did sins with his hands. He didn't put coals on Isaiah's eyes because he looked at the wrong thing. But Isaiah was going to be his spokesman, and he wanted Isaiah's mouth clean. Not that he was cursing, but he wanted him to confess the right things. I am undone. Oh, and I live among a people that are undone. Now, I'm no longer a pastor, but I just can't shed my pastor's heart. I just, I'm not sure I want to, but I can't. I'm not trying to be pastor. I don't want to be pastor. But every once in a while, I'll look like a pastor would and say, oh, and it just kills you. It just kills you when someone you know is going right and they choose the wrong way. And they go off like that, and there's nothing you can do about it because it's their choice, and it makes me cry. It just makes me cry. It makes me sick to my stomach. I hate it. And I don't want to get over it, but it's one of the things that I wish I could get over. <laughs> so, so what's God trying to do in Isaiah's life? Why the vision? Why the vision at this time? And the answer for me is this. If he could understand how holy God is, then he might understand exactly what God wants from him in his life. Because God wants us to live that way. And he wants, and this changes, not changes drastically in the sense of his theology goes in a different direction, but from this point on, he is boring in on sin and the holiness of God. You can see it in the rest of what he wrote. But the next five chapters, 7 through 12, are all about the coming Messiah. And then he predicts that Israel is is Judah will be come back from the captivity with a man named Cyrus. 150 years before Cyrus was born, Isaiah said he was going to be born and deliver his people. If you go to school and study theology, this professor, I guarantee you, depending on where you go to school, and I think almost anywhere anymore, will look at you and say, Isaiah it was really written by more than two people, more than one person, two and sometimes three. They call it Deutero Isaiah, and some people have Tritio Isaiah. <laughs> and what they say is this, I, no way in the world can chapters 39 and following be written by the same person that, did they teach you that in school? Went oh, you went to a good school? <laughs> I went to where they taught three Isaiahs. And because, how could anybody know that someone was going to be born 150 years before they were born? So it had to be somebody else. And the professor said that to me. And he said, well, what do you think about that, Mr. Horn? And I said, well, maybe the guy in charge knew who was going to be born. <laughs> Not so hard for me. How'd you come up with such a little God? And when I, at, on the final test, he had that question on there. How many, how, many, well, how many people wrote Isaiah? And I wrote one, but you think three. <laughs> So, I, I mean, I don't know where they come up with these crazy things, but I'm telling you this. Isaiah was motivated by sin, but he was more motivated by the holiness of God. This wasn't some man running around because everybody, he was mad that everybody was sinning. He saw who God was. At the, at, at the beginning of his ministry, God manifests his holiness to Isaiah to motivate him to be thankful. That's the key. And he never lost the vision. Now, how does that affect me? Excuse me for just talking about me for a moment. Because I, I, I was doing this, and after all these hours of study, one day I was sitting there. It was, I could tell you, it was 2 o'clock in the morning. I was sitting in my little library, and this question, I wrote this question down. I didn't even realize I wrote it down. How does all this affect me? Wow. And so here's the answer. God's holiness allowed me to be holy because... His holiness allowed 
and his perseverance allowed me to see through the word that he wrote. I don't know what your Bible says on the outside, but mine says holy Bible. Through the word that he wrote to understand that I had the need for Jesus Christ. All of my life for the last 40 years, I have put my faith in this book. I can't prove to you this book is real. But I can prove to you that it changed my life. I can prove to you that I've countless people that I've talked to, their lives are different. Either they're all confused, they're all deceived, or it really is true. That's why Satan is trying to destroy the veracity of this book. He'll try to make you think it's just written by men, it's just more words, and the truth is it's not. It was written by men who were superintended by God to write down exactly what God wanted us to know. So, why do I know that? Well, 1 Corinthians 6.11 says it pretty clearly, and the heathen, he, he's, he's got a list of a whole bunch of sins, I just wrote heathen there, is what some of you were. I was a heathen, you didn't have to prove that to me. I was in the Air Force 10 years. I was a tech sergeant. And one day we were loading a nuclear weapon and I fell off the wing. I was drunk. I was supposed to be in charge. I was drunk loading that thing. I fell off the wing. They were going to throw me out of the Air Force. Can you believe that? Just for something like that? I don't ever could understand why they got so mad. <laughs> my colonel, listen, Major Earl Follinsby was my commander. He was the navigator of the Enola Gay. Paul Tibbetts was the base commander. He was the pilot of the base. You know, the whole crew was on base. That man could find Hiroshima, Hiroshima to drop a bomb and didn't have enough sense that it was okay if I fell down. I'll be okay. And a man named Mike Koloski walked up and said, I'll take care of him. And Major Fallsby looked and said, well, Mike, I'll let you take care of him. But if he messes up one more time, I'm taking your stripe, not his. Mike wasn't a Christian. He was just a good man. But Mike did in my life what Jesus did for, my, for me years before that. I didn't become a Christian right away, but it was only about a year after that that I became a Christian. Maybe two years. Look, when I was saved, I was washed by the Holy Spirit. I was sanctified. There's the word for made holy. I was justified. Put in a place before God just as if I'd never sinned. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not what I did, but what he did for me. I was allowed to continue in the Air Force because something Mike Koloski did. I am saved because of something Jesus did. And the reason Jesus did it was to satisfy the holiness of God. First Peter wrote, you, and I, I, I read it, I, in fact, one of my Bibles, I got you out, and I've got Joel written there. Joel, you be holy, because I'm holy. See, people are commanded to be holy, but only God is acknowledged as being holy. See, I have some holy actions, meaning separate, set apart for God. And I realize that I'm set apart for God. So I'm not my own anymore. I was bought with the most precious price that has ever been given to mankind. And now I still am a slave. But instead of being a slave to sin, I'm a slave unto righteousness. My sin was imputed, put on Jesus Christ at the cross. When I was born again, his righteousness was imputed onto me. So now when he sees me as righteous, he sees the righteousness of Christ in me, not the good works that Joel does. Because if that were true, I'd be lost once a week. And I, I revel in what the, his holiness did because I know that if he said that, it's going to be true because he's holy. You see, God does... Here's, here's the question. What's the basis of my forgiveness? What, what, is, what does my forgiveness rest on? If I'm going to count that I'm forgiven, what does it rest on? What do I have assurance? What assurance do I have? So here's, the, here's a different way to ask that question. Does God forgive because he's kind and generous, like full of mercy? Or because he's absolutely just and right? 
I'll ask you the question better. Does God forgive on the basis of his mercy or on the basis of his justice? You all need to know the answer to that question because if you get that wrong, it's going to be hard for you to understand why you are saved and why you can keep on being saved. Now, here's the, here's the verse that tells you. It's my favorite Bible verse. I say this, I can't tell you how many times a week. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. All unrighteousness, sorry. Now, can you find the word mercy in that verse? Here's, here's my supposition. And if I'm wrong, then I made a mistake. Last week, I, I couldn't remember about the rock that Moses struck. It's Exodus 17, 5. As a matter of fact, he did strike that rock. So, if God would forgive on mercy, then the cross wouldn't become necessary. He would just have mercy. What would demand, what would demand mercy? Nothing. But what does justice demand? What does the law demand to be satisfied? You see, I'm saved because God was just. The law which he created said, do this. I wasn't able. So he did it. Can I explain that to you? Let's make pretend I'm guilty of a crime. I realize you would never think that I could do that, but let's make pretend I'm guilty of a crime. We can make it easy crime or a big crime. We can do speeding, which is a social crime, or we can do something that's much worse. I really don't care. Just a crime. <coughs> the crime, by the law, see, it's the law that makes it a crime, right? Is that right? Am I okay? Okay. The law has a penalty, and the law has a penalty that's high and just. The reason it's high is because the law did it. The reason it's just is because that's what the law demands. And if it wasn't just, the law should be changed. That's the way our world works. So, when I go before the judge, he has two choices, in a way. He could deal with me with mercy, or he could deal with me in a just manner. The law says he ought to demand me in a just manner. But he's a merciful judge, and he looks at me, and I look pitiful, like I always have. And he said, I, I, I'm just, I wish I could just let you go, but I, you see, I can't. I can't be just and merciful at the same time because the law demands the justice. I wish our legal system was still like this, but it's not anymore. So, you see, the law contains a demand which must be met. The law of this has a command that must be met. You know what it is? Perfect. Because if, according to James, if you break one part of the law, you're guilty of breaking the entire law. It's not about laws. It's about law. Anybody here ever lied? Then you're the filthy, no good sinner. Well, I don't care if everybody else lies. How many times do you have to lie to be a liar? Anybody ever hated anybody? Jesus said, you just might be guilty of murder. In his eyes. Anybody stole anything? Then you're a thief. Sorry. And you're going to walk up to God and all your thiefdom and say, I'm okay, I've never done anything. And he's going to say, you're a thief. You can't come into my presence. You cannot meet the law. That's the whole that's why we have an Old Testament, to show people that you need a Messiah. That's what Galatians says. The law is our tutor to demonstrate that we need a Messiah. Everything in it points to Christ. The reason it points to Christ is because you can't do the law. What demanded the law? God's holiness. So, but, suppose... The judge gets done and he looks at me and he says, I find you guilty. And your fine is some astronomical number. But I'll just say $100. It takes my breath away. I don't have $100. 
but that's my fine. Or maybe he sentenced me to something else. I don't know. He gavels, he slams his gavel down and says, case closed, court's closed. He gets up, out of his seat, and walks over to the court clerk, opens up his wallet, and puts $100 down. My fine is paid. I am legally free. I can walk out of that thing no longer required to pay anything because the judge paid it. He paid it in mercy, but in justice he condemned me guilty. He still retains who he is. You see, I was condemned by the eyes of the law, but his mercy let me go free because he paid the price, you see. But he didn't do it in mercy. He did it in justice. I, I'm not free because of mercy. I'm free because the law was paid. His mercy paid the law, but I'm free because the law was paid. Oh, uh, by the way, do you remember this verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him but have eternal life. Do you know what happened? God, the righteous judge, in grace, full of grace, in mercy, paid the debt the law demanded on Calvary. And now I walk out free. But I never say, oh God, thank you for being merciful, God. It was his holiness that demanded that Jesus Christ had to die. It was his holiness. So, my Bible teaches in 1 Peter, maybe this will help you with this verse now. For Christ also died once for all, the just for the unjust. Why? So that he might bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. I understand that it was mercy that prompted him to get up from his throne and go pay the price. That's what Philippians 2 is all about, the kenosis passage. That's when he gets off his throne and he empties himself and he comes to earth and suffers the indignity of being born through the womb of a woman and raised like every other person, live a sinless life and do everything he says so he can get to the cross and say these words. It is finished. And Joel could walk right past the court and now never say, you owe something. Oh, and by the way, if in fact the demands of the law is satisfied, think of the, the, the picture I gave you. Suppose I would go up to the court clerk and say, man, I know he paid the hunter, but I need, I need to have some skin in the game so I can feel free. Let me give you an extra 50. She would look at me and say, you can't because the price has been totally paid. Once it's paid, you can't add to it. So some people try to live better because so they could do, thank God more, you know, for their salvation. But the fact is you can't add to it. It's been paid in full by Jesus Christ on the cross. You have all of him you'll ever get. Hallelujah. By the way, hallelujah ought to go in one of these sentences. One of these sentences ought to be an amen or a hallelujah or something. If not, I need some oxygen in this room. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Could you even hear what I said? You said, praise the Lord. <laughs> so, here's the question. Here's the statement for me. What does the holiness of God mean to me? You see, in Christ, God has given me unattainable holiness. You understand? It's only God that declares things holy. We can't, we can't declare things holy. We, the human race, have been created in the image of God. Only humans can understand the holiness of God and have absolute communication with the God of, the Isra of Israel, the God of the universe, holy God. Animals can't. Fish can't. The flowers can't. The nature can reflect the holiness of God, but not have a relationship with God. So if since God is holy, he's not going to look at sin. I know that for a fact. 
So let me get to the last slide. Here we are. When you pray to a holy God, now you have to put, now this slide includes everything we've done for four weeks. And if you haven't been able to do this, if you will go to the church website, connect2central.com, up in the top shelf, you will see a thing that says media. Click on that, and everything that is preached on Sunday morning, I want to say it's the first service that's recorded? No. Second? 11? No. Okay. Okay. And Wednesday night is on that site, and the notes will be on it. And when I'm done this, I am going to send to the office my teaching notes for all four, in case you want to teach to somebody. And they will be there, and you just download it, and you, there's nothing copyrighted. I don't know enough to have anything copyrighted. So, Look, when you pray, the first thing you pray is this. When you pray to a holy God, you have to have this in your mind. I recognize your sovereignty. I recognize it. And I, agree, and I see that it's over me. Not only do I recognize your sovereignty, but I surrender to your power and authority because you are a holy God and I am not. I seek your domination over me, your dominion. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be Yahweh in my life. Why? Because I've tried it and I'm not very good at it. I, I want to gladly place you first in my life. I want to give you the charge of my life. I want you to make my decisions. I don't want you to be my first priority. I want you to be my priority. Because I don't want to have any second priorities to you. Because those seconds have a way to try to make themselves be first. And, and then lastly, I freely submit my will to yours. That means if there ever comes a question, your way is the right way. Now, we have studied the holiness of God. I challenge you to go back over it and, and learn it. Get it to the place where you are conversant in it. The more you know about God, the easier it is to live the life that he wants you to. So I can only ask you to do that. Do you have enough voice?